Okay. Hi, I'm Anna Bird. I work in historic preservation here at the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, and we are here with another Choctaw Tosholi talk. And today we have with us uh, film director Mark Williams. Um, Mark, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you're doing now, where you work? Uh, sure. Um, so, yeah, my name is Mark Williams, and I am a, a, a Choctaw filmmaker of Oklahoma Choctaw and Mississippi Choctaw. Uh, I currently live in Shawnee, Oklahoma, and uh, work for the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma. I'm the digital media specialist over there, but also still do freelance work as well. And so that's how I got to know Deanna and, and, the, and the departments over here. Awesome. Well, can you tell us about when you first became interested in being a storyteller? Do you remember if it was when you were a child? Was it when you were a teenager? Um, what was it really about telling a story that fascinated you? Just telling stories, I think it was probably, yeah, as a child. Um, it was more, I, I was kind of into writing and I still am. Um, I, I love writing and so I would find myself writing short stories way back then. Uh, I remember in school, um, I went to Bennington School um, here in Bryan County, and I would draw comic strips. I had a little, com had a little uh, this comic series going on for a while. And so it, at the time, it was just something that was for fun. I enjoyed writing, just doing different creative things. Um, I didn't know later that I was going to be used, you know, as a career, but um, it was just a fun thing for me to do back then. Um, so I think that's kind of where it started. Um, and then it just kind of never went away. Well, do you remember that shift from when you were writing and drawing to actually merging into video, um, yeah. becoming a videographer, you know, what was your first camera? What was the first thing you shot? Um, and kind of tell us about that merge. Okay. So after I left Bennington, um, Writing again was just kind of something I did for fun. Um, I went to college for a little bit. Um, I thought I was going to be, you know, an NBA, a basketball player. So I tried to do that route and didn't didn't quite make it. Um, so I, I ended up just I was working at a at a bank for a while, and um, and I don't know what happened. I just started kind of getting back into writing again. Something I just wanted, I enjoyed doing. Um, I got this crazy idea said I was I wanted to write a, a, a book. So I started writing this uh, this story, um, this this scary story, and I gave it to some of my friends. And when they when they were reading it, they they said that this looks more like a script, like a screenplay, more than like a like a book than like a novel. Yeah. And I started thinking about it. I said, well, I, I watch a lot of movies, so. My mind started it thinks more like scenes than like an, an actual novel. So it turned into a screenplay. Um, so I had the screenplay sitting here. It was, it was a little short, short film. I didn't know what to do with really. So um, talked my nephew and, and niece to being in it. My my brother uh, Nathan talked him into being in it, and we went out and just shot it at my house and uh, at my friend's house. Um, low budget as low budget as you can get uh, <laughs> uh so as far as the equipment um i can't even remember what kind it was it was my mom's camera i do remember that um it was one of those old mini dv tapes if you remember those mm -hmm. um, so yeah you put the little button the thing comes out and those little mini dv tapes you put in uh so we filmed it on that and uh again just kind of for fun, and we shot it in about in a couple of days and put it together. And um, it it was really bad, <laughs> but the process was a lot of fun. I, I enjoyed it. Um, still, at that point, I was kind of doing it just for the enjoyment of it, and um, didn't know that again it would lead me to where I am today. So that, you know, again, that moving forward on your, you know, kind of developing those skills and from that experience, it was just for fun. Um, you know, did you get formal training? Are you self-taught? 
yeah, self-taught. Everything is self-taught. And I, I've never been to film school. Um, never really even thought about it. Um, I started after that project. I made another one again, just kind of for fun. Um, you, I made a ton of mistakes <laughs> that the very first one. Um, I watched it, and um, inside, I guess I was kind of taking it serious because I wanted to make the other better. So I watched the first one, saw what mistakes I made, and tried to improve on it. Made the second one again, just kind of, kind of for fun. Um, we had a bigger budget of two hundred dollars on the on the second one. Uh, and I think the same camera. I believe it was the same camera. Uh, still was kind of filmed in my friend's uh, house, my house. Uh, my brother was in it, and just a couple of the, the same cast, <laughs> the same nephew and niece. <laughs> so, um, so we made that one. Uh, so it was it was probably a little bit better. Um, and then that one somehow ended up in a film festival and that's kind of where everything kind of took off from there. Well, tell us about that and what that film festival experience was like, you know, what were the feelings, you know, from going from making a film for fun and then moving on to here, you're at a film festival and here's this great film that, you know, you worked hard to get to that point. I wouldn't call it great. <laughs> <laughs> but uh so it, it, to this day I, I i don't even know how it got into the hands of his name was a uh, gerald wolford he was running the uh red fork native american film festival in tulsa uh the movie was called the dare and um i i, I had it put onto these dvds gave it to friends and family a few months went by and then I get this call from Mr. Walford and, and um, he, he says, we had this film called The Dare. Are you Mark Williams? Did you make this? And uh, I told him I did. And he said, well, we have this film festival here at, in Tulsa. We want to show it. Is it okay if we show it? You want to come by and, you know, screen it for us and everything. Never been to a film festival. I've heard of it, didn't know exactly what it was. So I agreed to go. And um, I agreed for, you know, to, to show it. Uh, so it was at the community college over there in Tulsa. And I think it might have been the second or third year that they were holding it at that time. So it was a three day film festival, a lot of films. Uh, again, I never been to one before. So I, I, I walked in to the auditorium and the place was was packed. I mean, like literally standing room only. Uh, and people were on the sides just trying to get in. Uh, not for my movie, but for the one, <laughs> the one right before mine was a movie called The Brave. And uh, this was 2006, I believe, or maybe seven. There was a film called The Brave that was produced, I want to say written, produced, and directed by Johnny Depp. He started in it with Martin Brando. And so it was an independent film that I, I believe Depp funded himself. And so he plays a Native American father in the film. And I don't know if it ever got distribution. So I don't know if it hit theaters or not, but I remember it was being an independent film that he funded. So everybody kind of, they came to see, you know, this film with Johnny Depp and Marlon Brando. And of course they played my movie right after The Brave. <laughs> so, you know, you have this, this, this film with, uh, uh, you know, a budget of, you know, multi-million dollar budget film. Then you have mine well, for $200. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nephews and nieces and, um, and so, uh, yeah, that, at that point I was thinking I made, made a mistake. I don't, I don't want to show it. I changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so they showed that movie and it, it was, a, it was a good film. And then, yeah, then mine, mine popped on. And uh, again, it was, it was a scary, scary movie. It was a horror film. And I sat way in the back. You know, I didn't want anybody to know who I was at that point. <laughs> but I started watching people in the audience, kind of seeing their reaction to see if they were getting it, if they enjoyed it. Um, it was a 19 minute film, 200 bucks, but People were screaming, they were closing their eyes, turning their heads, jumping, all at the right parts where I wanted them to. 
and it was like the 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 best feeling and uh it was kind of at that point i said man this is this is what i want to do just seeing that reaction from the audience just seeing them enjoy themselves and you know how when you're when you go to a scary movie with a friend and you, you jump at a scene you kind of look at your friend you kind of laugh you make fun of each other for you know for being scared just that 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 uh that interaction that they had and so just seeing that from them <clears throat> on this on this um on this movie that i wrote um the scenes and the the, the dialogue that i had in my head played out on a on a big screen um it was just uh yeah just a great feeling and i like this is this is what i want to do so after that started taking it more seriously started studying a lot more and started making more projects after that that's awesome so you know now you have multiple film festivals under your belt and multiple films that you've created and put out there into the world and um you know from that experience as an artist i'm sure you've grown a lot what are some what are a couple ways that you've recognized in yourself that you've grown <clears throat> um well, you know, with the, with every project, you know, again, you, you learn along the way. So you make less and less mistakes and you know, it, it, it's always been just a, a learning process. So I think I've um, gotten better at that. Um, I have think I've really created or just kind of found my my voice, my style, what, what I like to do. Um, every filmmaker, every storyteller, every director has their own style, you know. You can watch a movie and you can say, "Oh, that's a you know that's a Michael Bay film." You know, so you can look at certain things and see elements in it. And I think I've understood, or I came to understand it of who I am as a as a storyteller and what I like to or how I like to put stories together. And so I think that's something I really didn't have at that time. Um, I, I had films that that inspired me or, or that I liked, and I kind of borrowed certain things from every director. And then kind of formed my way of telling stories. So, so what are some of your future passion projects or dream projects that you want to you want to create in the future? Um, well, I, I really do want to get back to narrative um, films, you know, um, where I actually write the script, you know, the casting and directing and everything. I've been doing a lot of documentary work lately, uh, which I which I love. But uh, the last film that I did, where I actually wrote and directed it, was uh, Violet, which is 2016, I believe. So it's been about four years, um, and I miss it. You know, that's really I think that is my passion. I think is writing and directing that the process of uh, creating um, the, the the cast and just all you know all of that basically. And so I do miss that. Um, there i do want to get back to that here really really soon um i have started writing uh, a couple of uh, scripts uh for my next um, narrative film i've been approached uh, to do a short film recently uh so we're, we're kind of working on that right now um a dream film or dream project is uh, Coincidentally, kind of what we're about to talk about later, uh, the Trail of Tears, I think is something I, I would, on a huge scale, something I would I would want to do. Um, I don't. There hasn't really been a film released um, on a big scale on the big screen about the Trail of Tears like there are other events in in, in American history that you know that's told truthfully, and so that's something that I think I would want to do. Uh, as this kind of brings up a question I was going to save for later, but, you know, as I talked to a storyteller, you know, why do you think it's so important for us to tell our own stories, tell our own history um, and put that out there and put that voice into it? Well, I think I mean, that's that's the way it used to be. You know, we used to be, you know, that's how we told our history was through oral sto you know, storytellers, um, through oral history. Um, and I think natives by nature are natural storytellers you know we, i think we just kind of have that knack of, of, of storytelling and so um it's important that we tell our own 
we control our own narrative. Um, if you let other people take over, they're going to put their version of it. You know, they'll maybe won't tell some of the truth or some of the, the, the hardships that we actually went through. Um, kind of put them in a better light, maybe. Where we are telling not well, so of course we're going to put more the truth out there. You know, the, the passion of the stories will be will, will tell will be shown too. So I think it's very important that we, we tell it for those reasons. We yeah. kind of come back to that. Yeah. Oh no. Um, if you have ever considered any films or creating any more historical documentaries, hold on, about, you might like, go back a second. Okay. Can you hear me? Hold on one second. You might have to go back. I can hear you now. Okay. All right. Repeat your question. Okay. Yeah. So we had um, a question come in from. Okay, you went out. <laughs> You check the editor. No, I'm connected. Oh. Okay. How is it? Is it better now? Oh, that's a different question. Yes. Is it? It's in and out. It's in and out. Okay. Can you hear me though? <laughs> yeah. I, I'll, I can hear you for a few seconds, and then you go out. Can you type your question, Deanna? Yeah, that might be better. Okay. We're in the office today. This is a new thing for Casa Chifoli. So there are some slight <laughs> technical difficulties. So thanks for watching and bearing with us, everyone. Okay. All right, let's see, where's Deanna's question? It's not letting me send it. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? <laughs> I can hear you now, yeah, yeah. Okay, so have you thought about doing it here? Have you thought about doing other historical documentaries on like the 1830s, uh, 40s, post Dawes Commission, Choctaw era in Oklahoma? Have you thought about doing other historical documentaries? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think all that. I mean, okay, so when I went to school, I, I, I was not, I hated history class, which is, which is funny now because I love telling history. And so to my teacher uh, uh, in Bennington, um, sorry about that, but I did not really pay attention to history class, but um, I love it now. And so I wanna tell more, not only do I wanna tell it, I wanna learn it. So when I'm making these films, I'm learning things along the way, um, whether it's history, whether it's some of the uh, cultural connections, um, I'm learning it as well. So I would definitely be be up for that. Awesome. Brian has a question. He said, have you ever thought of doing horror films using Choctaw mythological creatures in a respectful way? Respectful way. That, it, that was, yeah, the main thing in a, in a respectful way. Um, again, yes. Um, and I kind of dabbled in it a little bit. Um, but it's, it's just a topic where what can he talk about what can you say what can you show um and it just always kind of comes back to that is, is it respectful is it something that shouldn't be there's some things that we can't talk about you know and so uh, i'm actually it's not a choctaw uh story but i'm uh working with a buddy of mine about Seminoles and creeks so we're kind of doing something something along the, those lines um he knows a lot more about um some of the traditional aspects of it. So a lot of it is I'm kind of deferring to him. So can we, um, I have a scene in mind. Can we, can we, can we show this? Can we talk about this? You know, a lot of it is 
is he'll just say no <laughs> we can't and so it's just a it's just a fine line and um you know for cinematic purposes it, it would be great to do some of that but i mean i i don't want to do it in a in a in, to be disrespectful about it and so um i would definitely be uh excited to do something like that if we can do it the right way yeah because you know me i love telling scary stories um uh and so that would be just right on my alley wow so um you know i've seen you know um your other other tracks, and I've seen wedding videos, and and you've talked about music videos in the past. So you've done a lot of um, different projects. What advice do you have for young um, or aspiring filmmakers um, about keeping that consistency and working on different projects to develop your style? What advice do you have for for up and coming uh, filmmakers? Um, you know. I I guess that I get asked that a lot and it's always a hard question to answer because I always feel like I'm on that side. I should be asking someone, you know, advice, but uh, there's something that I've learned, I guess, is to, okay, for, first of all, you always have to work hard. So that's just a given, but along the way, really don't take yourself too seriously. Don't take what you're doing too seriously because Along the way, you're gonna get it's gonna hit hit a lot of hard times. You'll hear a lot of rejections. Yes, no. It'll get stressful. But as long as you're enjoying yourself doing it, um, that passion will remain, and so it'll make it easier to get past those hard times. Um, early on, I kind of found that out where. I would make these films. I would submit submit to film festivals, and it would never get accepted. And you start kind of getting down on yourself, thinking, "Man, I, you know, I can't. Maybe I'm not. I shouldn't be doing this." Um, but if you just if you just do it for the love of it, you enjoy doing it. Um, you you'll, you'll find yourself. You're just you'll move on to the next one. You just kind of keep producing films. You will keep learning different aspects of it, and it's it's it once it if it stays fun, um, it gets easier to get past all those no's. Um, and eventually, you know, they'll start turning into yeses and, you know, that's when it really, that's when it gets a lot more fun. That's a good answer. Yeah. I think that's good advice. Okay. So let's get into the Ardmore documentary. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about that untold story and, um, what your impressions were when you first started? Uh, the Ardmore project, uh, came about. It kind of came out in, in a in a. I remember we was going to uh, uh, to Louisiana. I was with the Historical Preservation Department. We were on the way to Louisiana to do a documentary about basket weaving, and uh, we was kind of having a conversation, kind of like this. They was asking about projects that I'm working on, and I was actually writing, uh, and I still am writing a script about an article that I read about. Uh, 750 Choctaws came here from Mississippi in 1903, and they were taken to Ardmore to a place called the Love Building. And the one sentence I remember that always stood out in that article, it said, because the, the Choctaws, the following year, they were gone, they disappeared. And I remembered that one sentence that remained was, uh, in my head was, to this day, nobody knows the whereabouts of these of these Choctaws. And that just stuck in my head when I when I read it. And I was like, there's a movie right there. And so I started writing a script based on that removal. Um, everything up until that point was going to be kind of uh, factual. But once they disappeared, my story would take off. And it was kind of a it was it was a thriller. It was a horror film uh, of what happened to them. Um, but it was told present day. <laughs> so I remember we were on our way to um, to Louisiana, and, and uh, might might have been Ryan who asked me about it, asked about the projects I'm working on. I told him about this story, and I remember they pointed they pointed to you, and they said she wrote that article. And uh, so yeah, you and I started talking more about it, 
And um, at that time, I think the article was maybe a couple of years old, and you've done more research since then. Mm -hmm. And you you mentioned that uh, you you got to thinking about maybe doing a documentary on it uh, when the research is done. And I said I would, and I would love to do it because I kind of did some of my own research at that point. Um, not not on the level of you guys, of course, but um, I just I remember saying, "Oh yeah, I would love the opportunity to to tell that story." Um, and then probably like a year or so later, I, you know, you guys contacted me, and um, you you found out the whereabouts <laughs> of them and what happened, and um, some more of the untold stuff. And uh, whenever we had our first meeting found out more about it than just some of the uh the, the sinister plots i mean we kind of talked about at that time um it was something i think we it, it definitely needed to be told and um 2018 september 2018 was our first uh day of shooting and it was just it was a you know we were at the love building which was which was an awesome uh, place to start. And so that's how it all got started. Two years later, um, we're getting closer to releasing it. Yeah, I mean, it was it was it was one of those things where it just kind of came together. It was right. I mean, right people. And, you know, I think that we even had to research. But, you know, during the filming, we both learned from the community members. And what was that like for you kind of just um, learning in these layers, like multiple layers, we would kind of you know, stumble upon something, we would have a conversation and kind of be like, did you know that? I didn't know that, you know, and we would just kind of go back to the drawing board and, and really help shape um, the film. But what was that like kind of learning as we went um, from the community about this history? Well, that's kind of the fun part of filmmaking, especially with documentary filmmaking, especially because, you know, you're, you're, it's a, it's a, it's a process that's always kind of evolving. You know, whenever you start a project like this, you think you have an idea. Like I remember, I drew an outline early on, <laughs> sent it to you guys, and and you go, "Oh, this looks great." Um, if I look at the outline back then to where our film is now, you know, it doesn't <laughs> close to it. So, you know, you think you have an idea, but once you start meeting with the people that are involved, um, the 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 family whose ancestors were on this train. Um, hear their stories, you know, it, it, their, their stories, their family stories start taking a shape of its own and it basically outlines our film. And so that's a, that's a fun part of it for me. Um, using bits and pieces of everyone's story to help tell the overall part of it. So, um, that's a fun part of it, but it's also a, a challenge too, because there's so much stuff that's always changing. Um, sometimes we'll, like you said, we will learn a new fact. You know something that's important that we got to put into the film but once we do that then it kind of shuffles everything else around so um even though it's a challenge that is one of my favorite parts about documentary filmmaking because it's always it just you have to kind of keep uh keep on your toes to to get these things done so one of the things that's been a joy watching you over the last two years is that you have a real knack with just um, getting anybody to tell you their stories and talking. And so I've really, uh, it's been a joy to watch you with the elders and, um, you know, really be able to get them to open up and, you know, kind of chatting, even if it's off camera, you know, your relationship that you build with each of them and telling their story. So what was that like uh, for you in, in this particular project in terms of letting that community aspect shape some of our content. You know, I think that, like you had mentioned, we had had some ideas going in in our outline of what we wanted to talk about and then getting into the community, talking and having these interviews, um, it really kind of helped shape um, what direction we took. And so talk a little bit about that trust that you develop with the people that you end up interviewing or that are in your films. Um, it's probably a couple of things there. And I've noticed this when, especially when I'm doing chalked off films, whenever I approach somebody, um, especially meeting them for the first time, they're always going to be a little bit apprehensive. You know, they hear it as a, there's a film crew or there's a documentary being made. They want to interview you. They're going to be kind of nervous at first. Um, but it always helps because I, I'm for a lot of my projects, I'm, I'm a one man crew. So it's just me that walks in. And a lot of times they're kind of surprised by that, but they, it relaxes them. 
So that way there's not four or five people with lights and everybody just staring at them, you know, hanging on every word. It's just me, you know. And so um, as I'm setting up my equipment, I'm talking to them, you know, just just chit chatting. And setting up my camera, setting up the sound, just making me feel comfortable. And before you know it, everything's set up and we're across from each other and we're still kind of visiting. You know, I always kind of imagine it like whenever you visit somebody, like just hanging hanging out on a porch and you're just telling stories and you're just visiting someone, visiting an elder. And as we're talking, you know, they sometimes they don't realize the interview started and they've already opened up and they're just sharing stuff. And that is that's good for the film, but a lot of times I, I'll I'll forget too because I enjoy the conversation. I enjoy what we're talking about. I forget that there's a camera between us, which is great for me too. You know, it's the interaction that we have, and so they're opening up. Um, so that's kind of the, that's kind of one of the ways I get to uh, to get them to feel comfortable around me. Um, one of the ways it also is everybody knows my dad, so. Um, <laughs> so uh, here too, Olin Williams is, is my dad, <laughs> and, and you can kind of tell they're, you know, again, kind of a little nervous. And but then when I mention, you know, who my dad is, oh, oh, I didn't know he's your dad. And then it opens up, and <laughs> then they relax, and then then they're they're ready to talk. Then so um, I I use either one of those things to kind of get them to open up. Yeah. Well, and I really value, you know, your integrity with that trust because, you know, um, you know, sometimes things would be really good and you're like, oh, that's really great. But then you'd be like, you know, I'm not sure if I want to include that. And so I like that you balance that out, that you have that trust with them. You've developed that relationship with them. And then you're also thinking about them as people, you know, and their rights and what they would want. So that's that's important. Mm -hmm. um, what were some of the challenges of filming this particular documentary? Kind of what you just mentioned. There's some things that we probably can't you know, show or can't talk about. Um, there were some stuff, topics that, um, uh, well, this kind of comes back to when people open up. Um, with some of the families that, that I, I sat down with, they they tell a lot of stories and um, this film that we ended up putting together, it's, it's about 30 minutes long. We shot for two years. We got a lot of footage, a lot of stories. Um, we, we just can't put everything in 30 minutes. So just one of the biggest challenges is leaving certain things out. And that's tough on any project, really. Um, there's some stuff that I just sat there because I edit my films too. So I'm sitting there in the editing room, just battling, like I want to keep this in so bad, but either for for um, time reasons or for just because it just does, it, mess, it messes with the flow of the film. For different reasons, I have to leave it out, but it was maybe such a great, great story. Um, that's probably one of the biggest challenges on something like this is because you meet great people. Um, they're proud of uh, being chalked all, they're proud of their community, and, and they just open up. But we, we can only put so much into the film. I know when they watch it, you know, hopefully they'll, they'll like the film, but I know that they're gonna, you know, they're gonna ask me, you know, what about that part? I told you about my grandma. Why is why she in there? <laughs> you spent two hours at our house. Why isn't that all in there? Yeah. And yeah. so that's that's probably one of the biggest challenges is, is what to leave out. I mean, there's just so many stories out there that that needs to be told. And um, I mean, who knows? Maybe someday we'll go back and make a, a another a part two or something. I don't know. Yeah. Well, and the kind of contrary to that, what was some of the highlights of doing this? I know that you had mentioned, you know, getting to know the different elders and some of the, the stories that are coming out of it. And what were some of the highlights that um, were from um, filming this over the past two years? Hmm. I mean, that, that really kind of was it, just just visiting them. Um, you know, a couple of days ago, I, I needed some photos um, to finish this film. Um, and so I went down to Ada and I met with two of our elder couples and the photo part just took maybe, you know, five minutes to get that out of the way. But we sat there literally on their porch. This was, what was it? A couple days ago. 
literally sat there on the porch um, um, having coffee and probably about maybe two hours just talk. Can't no cameras rolling. Um, it's just that I think is just the interaction. Uh, talking about people we know, talking about this film, talking about other stories. Um, I think that's probably one of my highlights is, is, is that getting to know them. Um, and then there are some people that I interviewed with people that I already knew, you know, with Brad and Joe. And, um, I knew them from other documentaries that I've done more kind of more on a professional level, talking about what they did. But on this project, we got to talk about their family and how they got here, their family got here, kind of on a more personal level, got to know them um, as, as people. Awesome. Um, so what do you think about this film is going to help it stay in living, living memory? I know that was one of the things when we first started talking about it is that we were both surprised, like, well, how come, you know, all these elders knew about it or this community knew about it and it wasn't like something that we talked about. And um, that was kind of one of the goals with the documentary was keeping it alive, keeping these memories alive, these um, these stories, you know, whether it's this story or other family history stories. What do you think about this documentary that's really going to um, hopefully press upon people to keep these stories in, in living memory, encourage people to talk about, um, yeah. you know, their family history? Um. Yeah, that was kind of it. Yeah, I hope that it inspires them to to want to ask their grandma and grandpa more about it. You know, because when we when we spoke with Brad and Joe and some of the some of the younger ones, um, well, they're not very young, but um, <laughs> I mean, we we asked them, you know, about their grandma and grandpa, and I remember a lot of them said they didn't talk about it too much, and we had a hard time finding certain stories about. Um, them about their you know great grandma somebody from over on, on the train mainly because a lot of people didn't talk about it or a lot of times maybe their grandkids just didn't ask them and so i'm hoping that that's what this film kind of does is we want the younger generation to ask questions to want to know more to to you know learn more about your family uh, the history the language um your community and so you know at the end of the film, we kind of stress that we have a couple of historians talking about that. You know, uh, Les Williston does a great job talking about listening to your elders. Um, and we end on that note. So hopefully it's something that will inspire them to um, to ask questions. And like I said earlier, I think, you know, natives are great storytellers and just give them a chance to tell their stories and ask them. And you know, that's going to help keep it keep it going on as well. So Ryan has a question. He's asked, um, have you thought about putting your unused footage together as interviews or digital storytelling for future talk to us to learn from? So kind of compiling that, like what, what are your plans for all those things that we had to, to leave on the cutting room floor? Um, I think he's asking that because we interviewed him um, <laughs> when we did the audio <laughs> that one day, we was in this room, we did the audio and we just did audio for everybody else. Um, but for Ryan, I had the camera rolling, so I think he just wants to see if his footage is. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think that's something that, uh, we can we probably need to talk about because there's, um, so yeah, we released this film. There's these stories, but maybe as, as an archive or something, we have these other interviews with different elders from different communities, you know, from Durwood community, from buyers, from Durant. And so. And that's something that we could probably definitely put together. This time. He, <laughs> Ryan says fact. He does want to see his interview sometime. Um, so um, just kind of talking an, about another aspect of the documentary. This is also the first time that you've ever included any animation um, mm -hmm. in a documentary. And so talk about that a little bit about your decision to pursue that and um, a little bit about why. You know, I think that we talked a little bit about that. There wasn't any pictures. There wasn't any kind of uh, things to draw from from this event. Um, you know, it was kind of swept under the rug. Uh, you know, that being you know kind of an untold story. So, talk a little bit about what your inspiration was for including animation, and um, if you thought it was successful in, in, in achieving that goal. Yeah. So the animation part kind of came toward the end of the editing process. I remember. So we had the interview with. Um, 
with Scott Ketchum, who's our historian in the film, who does a great job. He knows his history. So I, I got two interviews with Scott talking about the removal coming over here, and once they got here, what happened while they were here in Ardmore. So that's about maybe six, seven minutes long. And so when we get to that part, like you said, there's no photo, there's nothing really um, that we can throw on top of it. And as a as a documentary filmmaker, you want to keep your audience engaged, even though Scott is telling some uh, very important information. You don't want to see him on screen for just seven minutes talking about it. You know, um, you want to keep things up there, keep the audience engaged, keep them um, watching the screen, but learning along the way. So that was a big challenge. Of what can we put on there? Like I said, there's no photos or anything. Um, I remember we were uh, just talking about, I, I mentioned animation, so there's something we could maybe, because um, there were some paintings that kind of inspired the the editing process as well. So I, and I asked you, what if we use one, a painting kind of like that, but we'd somehow animate it? And then that's when you told me that, um, that you do that. That's something that, that you've done in the past, as far as just as an artist with painting and uh, drawing. And, and it just turned out that you're, uh, your daughter um, is going going to college for that. Um, so um, I, it was pretty much, the, I think the decision was kind of made by them. We said, well, let's, let's try this. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so we started piecing these parts together, using just Scott's voice to tell the story, but using these images to help tell it as well. Um, so this yeah this is the very first time i've used any kind of animation in my film uh and it's been exciting to see the process of it i've seen what you guys come up with from the very beginning all the way to it's now to where it is now you know um i got the latest version last night actually and it was, it was just cool to see you know you have his voice to put the music on put the animation in front of it and it really keeps your story going and so i think it's really going to it's really what we've seen from other uh, films about chocolate history, we could see it this way. Yeah, it's exciting. So we have um, our first screening today, and we're looking for feedback for the film. Um, we are still in the works with video production um, and our media department to get it ready for the big screen or YouTube or however it's going to be released. But we're hoping for sometime in November. Um, and so um, whether it's a, a digital release or in the screen or in the big screen, um, we're hoping that this will come out to our community within by the end of the year. So look for uh, this film. And if you, of course, you want any more information, you can reach out to myself or, of course, reach out to Mark um, and also Misty Madbull. She's been a great um, help in the editing process and just be a sounding board for different ideas. Um, and so we can open it up now for questions. I thank you, Mark, for letting us pick your brain a little bit and ask questions. But um, if any of the community has questions, please um, kind of now is the time for you to ask Mark. Um, you know, we'll start. So, Mark, what's your favorite color? <laughs> your favorite color? Yes. Oh, man. Uh, let's see. I'm going to go with uh, what's the chocolate? <laughs> yeah, perfect. <laughs> no, I would say probably uh, uh, red and black, I guess. I always kind of mix those two somehow. Like, okay. Yeah. All right. Does anybody else have any questions for, for Mark? You can either text me or you can um, type them into the WebEx question bar. Hey, um, can you talk a little bit about your previous films that you've done? What was the topic? Um, I Okay, so uh, so she asked about the, some previous films. Um, so for the longest time, I was doing like short films. Um, I did a children's comedy called The Adventures of Josie, the Fry Bread Kid. Okay, yeah, you need to know all about this. Yeah, <laughs> Tell us more. that one. Yeah. Uh, so What's the storyline? I, should, I shouldn't have brought that up. <laughs> So that was 2012. Um, so I started again. I've never been to film school, so everything I was almost every project I was doing probably a different genre or different uh, format to try to just keep learning things. So I wanted to do a web series. Um, I wanted to do a comedy. 
And so uh, this was around when, around the time Marvel started getting really good. All these Marvel, Marvel films started coming out. And, you know, I, I love, you know, the, the Marvel films. And um, again, I started, I was doing comic books as a kid too. And so I just had this idea of a, of a boy who loved comics. And at first it was supposed to be, he gets these powers, these superhero powers from his grandma's fragile. But I said, well, where's the comedy in that? So I, I, what it, it turned out being is he thinks he gets powers from his grandma's fry bread. And so he loves comics. He loves grandma's fry bread. And there's this school bully. And it's, it's, you okay. can still talk. You can talk. Um, so he, he has a school bully, which is kind of his, his nemesis. And so, you know, different events come up in, in, in every episode. And, you know, he, he takes a five to five bread and but he, he, he's kind of a clumsy kid and he kind of stumbles his way to victory every time, but he, you know, he attributes it to the, the five bread. And so and there's a love interest in it as well. There's, he has a, has a crush you know, on, on the other side. So there's this kind of similarities with Superman and there's different, you know, superheroes you know, stories. And so um, he, he's trying to win the girl at the same time. Um, and so it's just, I think we did three episodes of it um, every summer, like 2012, 13, 14. Um, and so that was kind of my first stab at a web series. Um, around that time, I started doing uh, paranormal documentaries as well. Um, that was kind of because I wanted to learn about documentary filmmaking. Um, when I decided to do a documentary, I was thinking, well, what do I want to do it about? I love uh, scary stories, uh, ghost stories. Um, and that was about a time when a lot of these cable shows were getting big, you know? Um, and so, so we did one about um, a boarding school over in El Reno. And that was supposed to be kind of like a one-time thing. We screened it in Oklahoma City and that place was just packed and there was just natives everywhere. They loved it, and during the Q and A part, I I said something about you know where should we go next. Hands just went up. Everybody had a place for us to go, and then that kind of turned into a series. Now we have like seven feature films, I believe, uh, because of that. So um, after I started putting those together, started making kind of more documentaries, um, short films, um, highlighting. Uh, uh, native athletes um, did a couple of boxing films. I uh, did one called Shiloh about a girl that uh, she goes to Haskell. Um, and she was basically, she was a, a collegiate champion. Uh, she was trying to, trying to uh, pursue a, a world title or a, a national title. Um, so we followed her for a week, made this film and, and it did really well in the film festivals, won a few awards. Um, it won over uh, this girl, Chickasaw, Chickasaw, uh, the Mill Creek, uh, uh, Peyton, but she goes on Beans. So, of course, I had to name the title the film Beans, you know. And so she was an eight year old golfer at the time, and she was just killing it on, on the national circuit. So we followed her for a while and made that film. Um, so I kind of gravitated toward these fictional stories. One of the reasons I did that was because. We, we look at these top athletes, um, you know, we praise them and we celebrate them. And native kids, especially, they look up, you know, to them. I remember, uh, like for basketball, uh, Shimmel, you know, we, we see them on, on a national level, but, you know, what they don't see is what it took to get there. And so I kind of focused on that, you know, with, with especially with the boxers, all the ups and downs, the losses, the defeats, um, them working out. I mean, it's hard for them to work out sometimes. But Shiloh was a, was a really good one. You know, she was a single mom, full time student, working full time, trying to get this stuff. I mean, she was old on the go. So she has all these obstacles, but she had to go in front of her to try to meet. And what I wanted to do was just kind of show uh, Native people and then really kind of Native youth to, to look at people that you look up to. Well, along the way, they failed a lot too. So 
you ever try to reach your goal and you fall, it's okay. You know, um, just keep keep working at it, keep working at it. So I kind of wanted to show that. Um, the one with uh, the Pawnee Boxer uh, called Knife Chief, um, he had a good story. Um, again, he had the title. Um, he had a, um, an addiction to alcohol and pain pills and that he almost, he went really close to going down the wrong path. So boxing kept him on the right path. So I kind of wanted to show that, uh, show that um, aspect because that's kind of an issue that you know, a lot of uh, Native communities kind of go through. So, um, so I, I was using these films to kind of try to get a message out and hopefully inspire some people. Um, the movie I mentioned earlier called Violet was a, a feature film, uh, of course, a, a scary film, a horror film. Um, that one, it was probably the biggest one I've done to this, to this day. Uh, the biggest uh, budget that was about, I think, it cost about sixteen thousand to make. Um, that actually my own pocket, so I paid for that one. Um, got a great cast, um, great crew. I mentioned I, was, I do a lot of one man crew stuff. A project that big, we actually had a, a crew that came in and, and helped put it together. Um, that went pretty well in the festival circuit. And, a bunch of awards as well. So that was uh, my last one that I've done as far as you know, screenwriting that I want to get back to. Um, and then 2016 or 17, um, Ryan um, Cultural Services approached me about doing documentaries uh, for them uh, with stick ball and basket weaving, social dancing, and weaponry. So we did those four. And, um, and this one kind of came about. Well, so we have some more questions. Um, we have someone who asked, um, you know, you're out in the elements. Um, you know, what are some things that you do um, to take care of yourself, like the importance of staying hydrated and, you know, um, just eating well, sleeping well during filming? Because I'm sure that, you know, your editing process, you know, has you kind of at all hours and whatnot. So what is the important, you know, kind of that importance of um, taking care of yourself and during the filming process? Um, staying hydrated is probably one, one of the bigger things. Um, there's been a few times I know when we've been on shoots, you've asked about lunch and I, I've always said something like, you know, and I've, I've learned, yeah, when you, cause even though you can, well, maybe just me, I don't know. <laughs> I can <laughs> get, you know, in the afternoon, if you eat heavy for lunch, you get kind of sluggish and everything. So I've always just tried to eat certain light and, um, it even starts the day before, especially if you have a big, a big shoot coming up. So. Yeah, just staying, staying hydrated, uh, keep that energy. Because uh, when you're filming, uh, especially on, on a set, I mean, you're shooting for 12, 14, 16 hours days. Um, so it, 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 it can't take its toll. So you got to make sure you, you're eating right and drinking right and all that. All right. Um, so we have Bo who asked, how do you work out the conception of a film's look? Um, Bo is a uh, shout out to Bo. That's actually my boss over at Seminole Nation. And so, um, what was it again? The what was it? The, the look? How do you work out the conception of a film's look? Um, for me, I, I guess it'd be kind of a feel. I mean, kind of going going into the um, every project, you, you see it in your head. Um, and this is what I tell when I'm when I'm doing interviews as well, as um conversating with them, I'm editing in my head also. So I see kind of the scenes in my head. I, I see the color of it, the feel of it. Lots of time I kind of you kind of hear the music, I guess. I mean, I know the the mood that I want to convey, what I want the audience to feel, and color is a big part of it. So, you know, when you're shooting a film, you're even thinking about the background, what they're wearing, what is on the table, you know, colors really convey emotion. So you, you're thinking about that. And that's something I've learned along the way too. Before I would just put, point a camera and start shooting. Now, you know, we pay attention to what's in the background. And um, I mean, every little detail, a painting, what watches and every little thing like that is, they may not know it, but it's, it's showing through the screen. So color plays a big part of it. And it kind of starts at, at the beginning of the project. Um, Whenever we were talking about this Ardmore one, there's a lot of sad stuff that was that was uh, that happened. Um, but the contribution is that the Ardmore people uh, 
gave to the Oklahoma community or the Choctaw community still is being uh, cherished and revered today. That's that's a big selling point. So this kind of color to the film, you, you're looking at the contrast of it and it happens in post-production. Um, so it starts from the beginning of the film, but mainly because of what I want the audience to feel. And it just starts kind of happening in my head. It's kind of hard to explain, I guess, but. Um, yeah, and I, I've noticed you kind of have like a filing cabinet in there and um, you were talking about different places that you think of for like setting for shoots and you were like i may like this porch over here or this house over here or this window or this trees and so i i imagine it's like a little file box in there that you kind of flip through like okay yeah this will be the great shot so it was it was impressive to me that you've got all that like cut up in those little pieces put together um that you kind of you know put together to make a setting and there's been a lot of times I remember when we were out shooting stuff. Um, you're you're, <laughs> you're talking to me, and I'm not being rude. I promise. And you would you would look at me, and I, I'm not talking because in my head I'm thinking, okay, what you just said. How you know how are we going to convey that? What you know that particular subject is going to get this emotion? What uh, what chair are they going to be sitting on? What are they going to be wearing? What's in the background? Are we going to shoot outside, inside? So I'm thinking all that, and I remember you would just kind of you, 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 like, you know, <laughs> what are you thinking? Um, I think after a while you kind of learned that, uh, you know, I was trying, to, you know, I was putting all that together. You know, the wheels, the wheels were turning. <laughs> sometimes, you know, I would explain it to. Sometimes, whenever you, especially with an, when you're sitting there with an interview subject, sometimes I'll kind of explain why I'm doing this. Um, because it, it may not make sense, but I'm telling, I would say, well, I need you to sit over here, maybe, because you're sitting next to a window and I want natural light coming in. I don't want to use my lights. I want to use the sunlight. And so there's just different stuff like that. So I'll kind of explain it along the way. Um, okay. So, um, <laughs> Bo says something about, for the record, he's the one looking out for lunch, not the crew. I'm not sure what that means, but he, uh, that's what he said. Um, uh, let's see. He also asked, which is interesting. I was going to ask this too. Um, as you get older, are you still finding films that you like as much as the stuff did that you encountered in your teens? So has your, I guess your movie taste um, evolved um, as you've evolved as a storyteller, as an artist? That is a good question. That is a good question. Um, I think so. I mean, a lot of early influences I, are still, you know, creeping into my films, especially in the editing process. I find myself thinking about a scene that I remembered a long time ago that kind of uh, in, influenced me in, in, in a certain way. Um, I, I may not know it, it's happening, but I think, um, yeah, so I think it's there. Um, yeah, so I think, yeah, I think that's a good question. All right. So, do you have a favorite all-time movie that you that you kind of put in for comfort, or that is like your go-to? Man, that's that's a uh, I, I don't know. That's a tough question. Like a lot of movies. Um, I yeah, and I may get flack for this because he was a big director for a while. Then he kind of slumped off. Um, and he's writing too. Um, in my Shyamalan was one I really kind of liked early on, and he made some great films early on. Then I, he kind of got made some bad ones, I guess. But it was his writing style that I really liked. Um, the way he um, revealed certain things throughout the film, something that I kind of tend to do in my films as well. And if you look at some of his his work, the camera work will just stay on the subject for a long time. And that kind of helps fill suspense sometimes. Um, I remember one of the things that he said that always stuck to me when I'm making uh, thrillers and horror films is he said, I don't know what scares you. You know, what scares you might be different from what scares me, might be different from what scares the other. What he would do is create the situation. Like, for example, there's a door 
It's dark. You hear scratches behind it. He, he won't reveal the, the monster or the ghost early on in the film, but went to later. He lets the audience use their imagination. So nothing's going to scare you more than your own imagination. He just creates the elements around it. Sound is a big part of filmmaking. So you have that scent, that scratching of the door. Well, if I'm watching the movie and that's happening, my imagination already uh, pictures that that monster that's scratching the door. Your the monster in your head is going to be something different. But you're scaring yourself without even knowing it. So that's what he does is he kind of presents this and lets you scare yourself. Um, a lot of filmmakers would use CGI or they present the monster kind of too early on. And then you might lose the audience early on too. So it was that style of storytelling that kind of that I liked and I kind of used in my film as well. Um, a good example, Violet, the throw that I made. Um, the the entity, the ghost, the spirit of Violet. Like I said, it, it did really well. Won, uh, I think it won 12, no, 19 awards um, overall. No, one, I'm sorry, won 12 awards. 19 is the number of seconds that you see Violet on screen. It's every, the story around it is what scared you. Not really seeing her. And so you just see her at different times. So it was just that, um, that style of storytelling that, that he kind of left an impression on me. And I already kind of did that anyway, but just having someone on that uh, larger scale doing it and, and saying, this is why I do it, um, kind of creeping to my, to my um, films. Um, but as far as like a favorite movie, um, I kind of, whatever project I'm working on, I kind of tend to watch more. So if I'm, if I'm actually writing a script about um, a horror film, I'll kind of just watch scary movies. Um, I don't have one favorite film. I don't think I'll go to. Um, I probably do have a couple of go-tos, but I might, I might be too embarrassed to say. Like, <laughs> the B movies or, yeah. All right. Well, I have something to read for Sue. She wrote in, she said, I have known Mark since he was that mischievous little boy. And I guess that's why I can say I am very proud of what he is doing with the talent he has and doing what he loves to do today. She also says, I hope he has stories that is geared towards children and a way they can learn about their tribe and use animation, um, create a character for that particular tribe that our children would recognize. Um, is it a possibility for the future? Like kind of taking that animation and and maybe spin off onto some um, some uh, some stories and filming for that. Yeah, that's what's kind of cool about what we did with this animation. Now that it's like I said, it's the first time I've ever used it. Um, just watching what y'all did, um, I can I see how it, the, the impact of it. I mean, it it kind of inspired me to probably do something like that more. Um, and with animation, it would be something that would be, it'd be naturally kind of could be geared toward kids. And so that would be good to kind of maybe create a character that helps tell the language or is going through something. It could give life lessons. Um, there's things. There's a lot of things we can do with it. Um, that's kind of the magic, I think, with with animation too. You know, um, we're not limited to certain. Um, there, there's limitations, I guess, when you're making documentary, but with animation you kind of go. The, the, your imagination can go anywhere. So. Um, yeah, that'd be, that'd be pretty cool to do, I think. I think so too. We oh. did, we, um, um, with, um, Seminole Nation, uh, we visited some other, um, communication departments as well. We went to, uh, the Cheyenne Arapahoes, uh, they got their own TV station oh. over there and, um, we visited with them and we saw some of their work. They have a bunch of animations, uh, cartoons. Kind of what we just talked about. They have characters, they have a series basically, and doing those things. They're telling language, um, kind of giving life lessons along the way. So that was uh, fun to see. And I remember coming on the way back, we were talking about that. That'd be something cool to do with the Seminole Nation as well. So um, I think I'll try to do something like that. That's awesome. Well, um, Ryan's asking, where's Coda? So one of the things that um, I really like about your filmmaking is seeing Coda through that lens um, and just some of the little fun things that he's doing. And, um, you know, you kind of documenting his love already of stickball. 
Um, and so Ryan's asking where he is today, I guess. Um, why your, your little sidekick's not with you. He, uh, he should be in school right now. He should be, oh, well, maybe he's on his lunch break right now. But um, so, yeah, so me and his mom, we share custody uh, with him. So um, she lives, they live in Uwoka, I live in Shawnee, so it's not too far apart. Um, I get him every week. Um, but this this is the day that she would have him. Uh, but he is going through the homeschool thing right now. Um, I actually did a couple, I did a little time lapse video of him the other day. Uh, His little cutting skills. <laughs> cutting circles. Uh, and put a title on, on it and everything. But um, so yeah, he's home right now with his mom, uh, learning today's lesson, I hope. And what is that like for him? Does he give you any feedback? Does he groan whenever you, when you film, you know, when you go on little excursions and day trips and things like that? Does he groan or does he like it? Does he ham it up being in front of the camera? I think it's kind of, he's used to it now. Before, when we first started, would, would do that. He would he would want to grab the camera and try to do his things himself. But I think after we uh, we shoot something, and I mean, he'll be in the editing room with me. He'll see it. And uh, he'll see the finished product and he'll get excited. Like, that's me, that's me. And so I think he knows whenever I have the camera out, we're, we're, I'm working on something. So now he kind of, uh, I think he kind of, yeah, I think he kind of puts on a little show now. But uh, yeah, so the, one of the cool things is he's actually in this documentary. Uh, he's in a couple of scenes. So we needed uh, some Indian kids to just play. And so we got a couple of his cousins together and took them to the park and just let, let them run around and just be themselves. And so I got the camera and started just filming them. And um, for the most part, just let them play. But there was one part where I actually needed them to do something. And he stepped up to the plate and and uh, he took direction well and and uh, did a good job. So maybe there's a picture for that. Yeah, yeah, he's shaping up an actor, yeah. Well, that was one of the one of the most touch one of the touching scenes for me. That's what, that was a gotcha scene with the kids. So I hope that other people um, it'll have the same impact on them too. So, well, I don't have any more questions. I don't see any other questions here. Um, yeah, I don't see any. Do you have any more questions, Megan? Um, no, that's good. Ryan's got an important, a very <laughs> important question up there. Oh, what's for lunch? <laughs> well, we're, um, I think we're headed over. He's got a comment that said he's buying. Oh, okay. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. Is this open for everybody that's watching or just Mark? <laughs> All right, well, thanks for joining us today for um, our Cha 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 Sholi talk with Mark D. Williams. If you have any more questions, please just reach out to us here at Historic Preservation. And then also you can find Mark on Facebook. Bye. Thanks everybody. <laughs> oh, also our next Cha 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 Sholi um, will be about Cha Cha Stickball and it'll be a two part series. Um, so, you guys be on the lookout for that in um, two weeks. My dad's going to be there. Yes, two. his dad yeah. is going to be there. It'll be great. All right. Thank you. See you soon. Keep watching. Keep watching.